Our next speaker is uh, Tim Anderson, who many of you will have seen at, at this conference over the years. Um, Tim's a mechanical engineer with over 20 years experience in, uh, in working in industry and research. Um, he's, uh, he has recently been appointed as the Director and Professor of Engineering at Charles Sturt University. Um, he is uh, amongst many of the people here, he's also a UNSW graduate. But he did his PhD in Waikato University in um, in New Zealand and spent some time there um, working at the U Victoria University of Wellington. Um, he's worked closely with industry a lot along a, a number of areas, and um, and he is a member of the Australian Stands Committee on uh, Solar Heating and Cooling, and um, also. Um, the joint, um, also the committee on high temperature, the New Zealand Stands Committee on high temperature heat pumps. So please welcome Tim. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that introduction, Ken. So yes, um, after 13 years in New Zealand, I've decided to jump back across the ditch and uh, recently joined Charles Sturt University in Bathurst and preempt. Yes, we do have engineering. I think whenever I've said I'm from Charles Sturt, the response has been, I didn't know you did engineering, but yes, we do. Um, anyway, my talk is, I guess, to quote Monty Python, uh, now for something completely different. I'm being signalled to step this way. Oh, now I'm getting a thumbs up. I have one very happy person up the back there. So um, I'm going to be talking about solar thermal energy systems in the built environment. So I'm going to be looking at some of the, I guess it's a bit of a history lesson of at least the last sort of 10 years of APVI conferences and uh, ANSYS conferences and so on before that. So looking at the opportunities, the challenges and how we can use sort of engineering design um, to address some of these things. So, like I said, this is probably uh, a bit out there given that we've heard lots of talks about PV. And I'm going to start talking about solar water heating. And looking at this graph, we could probably call it Tim's existential crisis because we can sort of see that back here, when I was starting out in the world of solar, everything related to solar water heating seemed to be on the way up. And around 2012, we can see that everything kind of heading the way down. Um, so primarily, this is a result of the contraction of solar thermal in Chinese uh, market. But between the beginning and the end, there is actually you know, a, a bit of growth there. So I guess this is probably distorts things a little bit. If we look at uh, different sort of solar thermal technologies in closer detail, we can sort of see that, um, you know, there's a couple of stories at work. We're seeing that, you know, there is a bit of growth in solar water, unglazed solar water heating, photovoltaic thermal, and just your regular solar water heating. I guess the problem though is that, um, Australia, at least, has been going backwards in terms of its application of solar water heating since the global financial crisis. So that, however, is offset by large growth in some of the um, non-traditional markets, so Latin America, uh, Africa, um, some of the Asian countries where we're starting to see it. So, you know, we are often... I guess over the last couple of days, there's been a very hem heavy emphasis on electricity. But we need to recognise the fact that actually around, you know, it could be half to two thirds of domestic energy use, well, electricity energy sort of use in Australian and New Zealand homes is actually heat. So it could be water or space heat. So there is a lot of value to be extracted here. So I guess that raises you know, the question, 
Do we have serious challenges or serious opportunities? You know, they tend to be uh, linked. Yeah. And I guess from my perspective, there are four main issues that we see. Cost, everyone loves a dollar. Um, so, you know, we've seen a massive decrease in the cost of photovoltaic systems, but solar water heating, obviously being a very mature technology, has sort of stayed relatively static for quite some time. Um, similarly, we, we sort of see things framed as a, a PV or a solar water heating thing. And, you know, that's not necessarily a helpful way of, of viewing solar technologies. We need to, I guess, apply a bit more systems thinking, bigger picture thinking, and thinking about, you know, can, can these two things complement each other? Um, now, on, in conjunction with those, we've got a, a few other issues. Aesthetics. Not everyone likes a lovely thermosiphon solar water or heater on their roof. Some people can find them um, visually as offensive. So you can sort of see here we've got, um, I think this is in Israel. Uh, now, I like a sol good solar water heater as much as the next person, but that may not be to everyone's um, aesthetic tastes. And then the other issue, and it's not just a solar water heating issue, it's a PV issue as well, is the load imbalance. When we are generating energy, it's not necessarily when we want that energy. So there's a few challenges there. And um, if we are able to address these challenges, then perhaps they turn from challenges to opportunities. So I, I guess what I'm going to talk about now is um, about a decade and a little bit more of the work that I've been doing in the sort of solar water heating space and uh, domestic energy sort of space over the last, yeah, um, well, I've been based in New Zealand and a little bit of time in Australia in between. So you can see New Zealand on this map quite clearly. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, that, that's that's one for the Kiwis to offend them. Um, so, yeah, Aotearoa, New Zealand, tends to get left off maps, and uh, we do sort of get, uh, you know, we're not thought about as a powerhouse of solar energy research, so uh, there's something at play there. Um, the other thing, with New Zealand, I guess, can be summed up by this. So those of you who are from a chemistry background might recognise uh, one of New Zealand's Nobel Prize winners, Ernest Rutherford. And I guess this is paraphrasing a, a famous quote, which is, we've got no money, so we've got to think. OK, so this is probably a, a maxim of my time in New Zealand. It, it didn't have um, any large funding schemes. There's no arena to throw money into solar research. Um, it's something that isn't really even considered. Um, it's only starting to perhaps become a bit of a conversation when you get into sort of utility scale PV. It's very much uh, playing a, a minor role, so. A lot of the work you'll see, it was no money, so it involved a lot of thinking and um, being able to make the most of what was around. So the way that you know, I, I guess I like to approach these things is um, I'm a mechanical engineer and my passion's always been around sort of mechanical design. So um, there are uh, lovely models of design thinking, and they look something like this, where we sort of define a problem or you know we um, empathize with our user, 
to define that problem. We then go through this lovely process and, uh, you know, it's potentially an iterative sort of process and eventually we come to some lovely solution. But um, that's a lovely model and that's, I guess, what happens more often than not. And that's probably, as you can see there, that's more my reality. I tend to do a lot of different bits and pieces because they interest me. Um, so what you're seeing is sort of a snapshot of a, of a lot of the different things that I've worked on. So I'm not sure whether there's as many people in the room who've been to almost, I think I've only, the only stream that I haven't presented in has been PV devices. So everything else I've done something somewhere along the way. So lots of different bits and pieces and yeah, that's my thinking. Um, okay, so. Another quote. Anyone know where this one's from? Yes, Alistair. Oh, <laughs> why does it not surprise me that you're a, a, a fan of musicals? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I guess this really isn't the start of my career in solar, but uh, yeah, this is a, a good place to start. And um, it was very much around the issue that, are, you know, some of the issues that I raised before around cost, uh, whether we use PV, whether we use water heating and aesthetics. So I guess when you try and combine all of those things, one of the natural ends is building integrated photovoltaic thermal. So we're going back quite a way. Um, what um, so I sort of came up with was this idea of using long run uh, metal roofing and forming this trough in the back of it, which would then sit under a photovoltaic module. So this was all made out of low cost commodity building materials, color, coat, steel sort of things. So we did some work on that and everything performed quite well. Obviously, the use of commodity building materials is hopefully trying to um, drive down that cost, plus the fact that you have your electricity, your hot water and your roof all in one thing. You know, the, I guess the theory or the idea was that this would result in some cost savings. So we did some um, testing on it. It all sort of performed well. Uh, one of the things that we identified was um, you know, there might be the potential to actually reduce materials even more. So if you're designing a solar water heater, you'd pack a bunch of insulation in there. But with a building integrated roofing system like this, what we found was that actually we could use the roof space as the insulating medium itself. So if you pull out a heat transfer textbook and you look for good insulators, you know, you might think of um, I don't want to I don't want to necessarily endorse any particular brands, but you know, your Bradford Gold or Pink Bats or something like that, you'll see that they have a pretty good uh, insulation characteristics, but if you look a little bit further, what you'll find is that air is actually a really good insulator. That's the reason, you know, your Bradford Gold, your Pink Bats are such good insulators is because they hold all this air in. And the reason they perform is because they stop the air moving around. If you can stop air moving around, you've got a really, really good insulator. And so we use this principle by implementing a passive baffle into a roof space. And we were able to show that actually the inclusion of that baffle um, was able to improve the insulation characteristics for our roof space. So we were actually able to utilize a passive mechanism for insulating our building integrated um, PV thermal system. So I guess what this sort of highlighted was actually when we start using these systems, we talk about integration rather than onto-gration, okay? It's not just build this thing, chuck it on top, forget about it. It's actually thinking about how it interacts as a system and how we can potentially utilize design type thinking to address 
some of the problems. But of course, yeah, one of the challenges was very much in the manufacturing side of it. Um, so we took this idea a little bit further and sort of thought, well, you know, we've got this cheap thing and at the time PV was still quite expensive. Maybe we should just throw that away and turn it into a building integrated thermal system. Um, and hopefully this delivers some aesthetic outcomes um, and potentially we look at, in one instance, addressing the issue of load by dumping heat into a swimming pool. So that's what your typical pool heating system looks like, not necessarily overly aesthetically pleasing. Um, so as I said, we removed the PV. Again, we're utilizing a commodity building material, so quite cheap, and through design, we're actually able to get good performance from it. And that's our pool heating system there. So it's a um, little shade area for people using the pool and it was heating this dive pool here. So from that uh, system, we're getting sort of around a two degree increase in the temperature of the dive pool, which um, if you've ever been swimming in New Zealand was like diving into a, a bucket of ice even in the middle of summer. Um, so, you know, there, there's just another way of actually utilizing these real low tech solutions. Ken's telling me that I have not much time, so I better keep moving. So a few issues that needed to be addressed. Um, taking the idea further using these low cost building materials, it was sort of like, well, why do our solar collectors just need to be black? You know, the old, you can have it in any color as long as it's black. Try and address the aesthetics. So what we did was we did some uh, examination of the optical properties of different colors uh, from these color coat materials. Again, building integration. Um, and what we found is that actually color doesn't make as big an impact as you would expect. So we did some a really simple F chart analysis um, for water heating in a house. And what you can see is, you know, yeah, you're black up here, but if you sort of go to other colors, even down to white, your performance still isn't, uh, I don't want to say ridiculously bad, but um, yeah, it, it's still able to contribute something and you can have your collector in any color that isn't black. Um, so, you know, it's potentially a trading off an aesthetic consideration um, against the performance. So why just the roof? Well, we've also looked at facade integration and looking at some optical analysis at the time. The current wisdom was why the hell would you put PV on the facade of your building? That's insane. It's not going to perform very well. So we came up with this little design that utilized a passive reflector. So here we would have a PV module with a cooling tube and a flat reflector there. Um, all of these angles were determined basis on your solar geometry and stuff like that. So it's all passive, flat, again, using commodity building materials. There's some opportunity for modularity. Uh, what you get is improved winter performance because of that flat reflector, because the sun's much lower in the sky you'll tend to get some reflections off there. So you actually get a bit of an improvement during winter. Uh, you know, that's your electrical output. So, you know, there's an opportunity there for systems like that in, I guess, high density areas where you don't necessarily have a lot of roof space. Um, but then there's the question of how do you quantify the performance or how do you quantify the resource? So, We've done some work on that as well. We've done um, some ray trace or the development of novel ray tracing, reverse ray tracing techniques to look at uh, the radiation falling on facades. So using uh, digital elevation or digital surface models. We started with a very simple geometry just to sort of test everything out. 
and then utilized this new method to actually quantify what was happening on the facades of this is the university um, I was at in Auckland. So looking at what's occurring on each of the facades of the buildings around the campus. Um, so, you know, this is potentially an opportunity for sort of large scale uh, community urban planning type stuff, because now you can look at what's happening on um, the facade and can you deploy solar better? So what if you don't want building integration? Well, another thing we've looked at is uh, low cost polymer collectors using rotational molding. Um, performance was similar to your standard flat plate collectors. Um, what we found was that actually there may be an opportunity to reduce the cost of these by again, removing insulation and relying on air to act as an insulation. So if you do that and you look at the um, modeled output from them, there's not a huge compromise, there's not a huge penalty to be made between having it insulated and just having a trapped air layer in there. So, you know, there's an opportunity to sort of reduce the use of materials through clever design in your collector. So, again, that's, you know, that role of design. Um, okay, what are we going to do with all the heat? Well, we could use a building integrated combi system. So there's your typical space heating loads for a few locations around the place. Um, and you know, there's a significant opportunity there to utilize these very large areas that you would have with a building integrated system to provide your space heating through you know, radiators or underfloor heating type systems. So, you know, there's opportunities there that we really haven't sort of cotton onto in uh, the cooler parts of Australia and New Zealand. Okay, but then you're sort of saying, what about summertime? Well, what we've also looked at is thermal, thermally driven cooling. So, um, one of the challenges with thermally driven cooling systems, in particular diffusion absorption refrigeration, which is what we looked at. So if you've ever used a camping fridge uh, with a gas canister, that's the cycle that's used in there. Um, the technology from before the age of political correctness, as you can see there. Um, so what we did was we actually looked at utilizing this technology. It's over a hundred years old. It's been around since yeah, the early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, we looked at the performance of this. One of the issues is around this bubble pump that it uses. So if you have a coffee percolator, it uses a similar principle. Um, if you can generate more pumping, you can get generate more cooling, but problem is there are flow regimes that need to be addressed. Uh, so what we did was we actually utilized um, neural networks to determine what's happening if you were to have multiple pumps, because you can't solve the problem using formal methods. Um, everything becomes extraordinarily complicated and difficult. So we were able to utilize neural networks to determine the performance um, as we were increasing the number of tubes in the bubble pump. So old technology, new opportunities. Um, unglazed collectors, you know, one of these things that extremely low cost, but terrible performance generally. Um, we've looked at them for radiated cooling. We can get sort of around 80 watts per square meter out of them. Uh, it's all dependent on the sky temperature. So, you know, there's a lot of locations where it may be suitable and some where it's probably not so much. And that's, uh, generally a function of humidity and things. So that's another potential area where we can use low cost technology uh, differently to try and address some of our energy needs. Um, more on unglazed collectors, we've done some work looking at, you know, whether we can use building structures as passive wind breaks um, to improve their performance. And so on. So, you know, there's a bit of work that we've been doing on that. Again, this is that design thinking. Can we utilize 
what we've got to better effect. So that's kind of what happens when you have a, an unglazed collector and you sort of move it around um, and you can potentially have it shielded from the wind, which means that you have reduced heat losses and so it performs a little bit better. Anyway, um, I'll just finish off with a bit about thermal storage. We've been looking at novel thermal storage systems. This is actually a, a study we did with tanks with no insulation, and we showed that you can include passive baffles inside these tanks. And because they suppress the convective heat loss or they suppress the natural convection in the tank, they're actually able to reduce the heat loss. Um, and quite noticeably. So you can sort of see here, if we have no baffle, we've got something like this. And this is for a like a cool down test. When we've got a very long baffle, we can actually maintain the temperature in the tank for a longer period of time. So again, simple tech for addressing complex problems. So, you know, that's that first one wasn't realistic. This is probably closer to reality. I'll quickly flick through that. So is research into domestic solar thermal still a thing? Well, again, we'll go for another quote or potential quote from Mark Twain. What's my death being greatly exaggerated? Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who has contributed to this success is a team effort. Um, so those are some of the people whose work has been featured there. And obviously I've had a lot of other PhD and master's students in the way who've helped me with things. So I'll go back to any questions. Hello, Dave, and you know, get us back on track. Or... Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, really good to get through that histor historical look at things and um, and see some of the ways you can get around uh, lack of money. Uh, do we have, we probably have time for one question. Roger. Tim, you, you, you mentioned uh, solar thermal for cooling in homes using absorption technologies. Can you yep. update us on what the latest and greatest in that is? Um, I haven't looked at it for quite a few years. So, um, I know that CSIRO were doing a bit of work, but that wasn't in diffusion absorption. That was in, I think it might have been adsorption type systems. Um, there was quite a bit of work in Europe in that sort of space. I haven't had a look at it of late, um, but you know the, there is a definite opportunity there. The one thing that you could potentially do is, uh, there's a system called Combi Plus, which is, a combi system for space heating in winter and then using the excess heat for driving a thermal um, chiller during summer. So I guess coming back to your, your yeah. original point of, of, of being a bit perplexed that it seems the trend is towards having PV and then using the electricity to run a heat pump to do whatever you need. Yes. Do, do, do you think that is the way that we're going now or is there still is, a, a strong role for solar thermal well that that would be my observation in australia but obviously there are other places in the world where that isn't necessarily the case um you know i think in that first graph that i showed you know you've got latin america and um some of the asian countries places like that where you know there is actually still growth in the sort of solar thermal and you know, I guess there's a, a philosophical thing there around, you know, should we be using these highly complex systems if we can potentially achieve it through simpler means? Thanks very much, Tim.